What's up, mathletes? It's Coach Allen. 4-7 is part two of our applied problems in calculus where they are mostly words, aka word problems. Now, these ones are called optimization, where the ones that we did in 4.1 at the beginning of this chapter, it was all on related rates. So you're going to have to see and differentiate between the two, no pun intended, where you're going to use these strategies versus the related rates, the GFW, give and find, and win. So let's go through a few things here, give you a few pointers, and then I'll just do a few examples to make sure that you guys get the idea of how these are different than the ones that we've done before on 4.1 related rates. I know, I know. Here we are again with word problems. And you're probably thinking, oh no. Keep in mind, there are some strategies to help you with all of these. And so I'll give you a few general strategies, kind of like our GFW, but going to be different because these are different. What does optimization mean? Oftentimes, it means to optimize or maximize, minimize something that we're trying to deal with, whether that means maximize the area of space that we have given, minimize the perimeter fencing or costs, all different types of things that we can look at and try to optimize. So the key words that you're going to be looking for on these compared to the others, the related rates, the rate of change that we were talking about, whether they flat out say rate of change, speed, velocity, how quickly something happens versus optimization. You're going to be looking at how can we maximize or minimize something that we're dealing with. So to look at these scenarios, here is a general way to approach these. So just four steps here that I'm going to kind of walk you through, and then we'll actually do these. And of course, where should you start? Read the whole problem. Okay. See what you've been given and see what you're obviously asked for, and then work backwards. Remember, some of the secret sauces to all of mathematics is getting one equation with the variable that you want to find. So go back and read it slowly after you've read the whole thing. Make sure you understand what you're asked to find. Use what is given and check and see if there's any stipulations. And of course, what helps you to come up with all of that information besides just reading it? Step number two, like we did before, draw and label a diagram or picture so that you can ultimately get to steps three and four, where we will figure out and determine which quantity we are trying to maximize or minimize. And remember, those are going to be key words for these optimization problems compared to the 4.1 related rate problems. And of course, we're going to have to utilize all of that information in order to come up with an equation that uses the variables that we have either information on or that we were tasked with maximizing or minimizing in general, optimizing. And oftentimes, if we can't solve for just one variable and substitute it into a different equation, if they're giving us multiple parts, then we will use implicit differentiation so that we don't have to get a nastier function or equation that's already got multiple variables involved and we can just differentiate then. Step four, what are we going to be doing in calculus? Calculus. And that is to take the derivative or differentiate and use that first or second derivative test to find those high and low points, those local max or mins that we called the critical point or value. Now, remember, those only find the local max and min, so we got to keep into account that we want the absolute, we want to optimize. We want the absolute maximum or the absolute global minimum. So sometimes we may have to, if there are such things in that scenario as endpoints and not just where our first derivative is equal to zero, those critical points. So this is just a generic way to help you find out how to solve these, what are called optimization problems not necessary to use this technique, these four steps. And if you want to narrow it down to just one, you can say, we're going to have to use calculus to find those max and mins. That's it. 
I hate to feel like there's not a whole lot that I'm going to give you. The good news is there's nothing new. The bad news is you know word problems. The most difficult and challenging part of them is taking that short paragraph or few sentences and changing those words into a mathematical sentence or equation so that we can then use our techniques that we've learned up to this point in our math careers to solve. So without further ado, let's do a few examples and see a few different techniques. Now I'm going to warn you right now, there are tons of different ways or types of problems that optimization can be used for. I can't do a different problem for every scenario. So that means you guys are going to have to do a little bit more, maybe go and read the book, uh, check out some videos, but ultimately get in there, start trying them, and then hopefully you'll get the hang of all the different types as they will be similar. All right, here we are, our first example. This is actually number three in your notebook drills and exercises. So we're going to do this one together and then I'll do one more for you. Uh, just a different look so you kind of have an idea of how to start some of these different types and then you're on your own for the rest and that's the only way that you will be able to get the hang of these is just by getting your hands dirty. So let's go to the farm. First things first, we always want to read the whole thing as we mentioned and then highlight some of the things that we feel that we can utilize in order to one, draw a diagram and then two, most importantly, set up an equation to solve what they asked us to find. So here we are building five identical pins to house our animals or whatever we're doing on the farm, and they're all adjacent to one another, meaning they share a side. If the total area that we have is a thousand square meters or meters squared, then what they want us to figure out is if we have that much space to work with, how can we minimize the amount of fencing that we would have to use? given this plot of land or this area on our farm. So now that we have an idea of what we're dealing with, which is obviously one of them being area at a thousand square meters, what is the other thing that they gave us to work with that they asked us to find? That was the dimensions to minimize the amount of fencing. In a roundabout way, that's a form of perimeter. And we need to fill in that equation as well. And to help us do that, let's draw a sketch. All right, I got my drawing here with my one, two, three, four, and five identical pins adjacent or sharing a side to one another. And of course, what we are trying to find are the dimensions that we can, again, most importantly, this word, Different than our related rates, where it would say how quickly, how fast, at what rate, even sometimes. Now we're going to be throwing out things like what to optimize, maximize, or minimize. And in this case, it's perimeter. So let's label this drawing, this graph. And I'm just going to call these bottom segments here all an unknown length of x. And then the upright running up and down, the y. And if I was to talk about the perimeter, now remember, we're not going to just fence off the outside because then we'll have all of the animals co-mingling or even our crops. So what we have to do is not only take these outside pieces to represent our perimeter, we're also going to have these inside lengths of Y as well. So again, just loosely calling this perimeter, for lack of a better term, we don't have one. So what is the sum of all the fencing that we would have to do in order to have those five adjacent identical pins. Well, down here, we got one, two, three, four, five X's, and we would have the same up here. So all together, that is going to be a length of five X, and we would have it twice, 10 X's. But we're also gonna have the two outside Y's to make up the actual perimeter, and we're going to have an inside y one, two, three, four times to partition up our five identical and adjacent pins. So we got the five x's on top, the five x's on bottom, plus one, two, three, four, five, six y values. So adding all that together, that would be and represent our perimeter. But 
as we know to minimize or maximize or in general optimize, we're going to have to take the derivative of that quote unquote perimeter. We don't prefer two variables in our equation because then we'll either have to solve for one or do it implicitly. So let's use the other equation that they also gave us information for. And remember to find the area inside of a rectangle. We can just take the length and the width and multiply those together to get our area. And now we have two equations with those same two variables. And if you remember from algebra, when we had two equations, two unknowns, we actually had two, you could even argue three techniques. Graphing, which usually wasn't the best, but substitution and elimination were the algebraic ways. And for this one, I'm going to solve this equation for y, since I know what the area is equal to, and I will keep the p perimeter by itself to take the derivative and minimize this thing by solving for y and substituting it in there. I will only have x values, which will be much better when finding the derivative. So solving for y, we get 200 over x when we divided both sides by 5x. That then allows me to substitute this in here and get 10x plus 6. Now my y I will rewrite as not 200 over x because I'd rather not be dealing with a quotient rule when having to take the derivative of this equation. So I rewrote it as 200x to the negative 1. And when I multiply that by 6, that gives us 10x plus 1200x to the negative 1, which now we have our one equation with just one variable that we want to minimize. So we will find those critical values by taking the derivative, setting it equal to zero, and finding what our x values and possible local max and mins would be. So doing that yields easy, simple derivatives, just a power rule twice, and we get 10. Careful, that would make it negative 1200x to the negative 2. And now what we'd like to do is set that equal to 0. To find those critical values, that will be our max or mins. And in this case, obviously, we want to minimize the amount of fencing to cut down on our costs, labor, work, all of it. But still have our five identical pins with the area given to work with. So let's add the 1200 over. And once we do, that will cancel this out. So we only have 10 on this side. And on the other side of our equal sign, the 1200, I've rewritten back as over x squared instead of x to the negative 2, so that I can then attack this problem to solve for my x squared. And since that is being divided by x squared, I will multiply. And also to get rid of that, I'll divide by 10. So now the x squareds on this side cancel out and the tens on this side cancel out. So I'm just left with x squared equals 120. And now I can take the square root of this finally to get both my positive and negative possibilities, which is if I break this down, I know it's 4 times 30. And I know the square root of 4, don't know the square root of 30. And I can't break that down anymore. So these would be our critical points are possible local maxes and mins. And of course, we would assume that we're only looking for the positive case because we are trying to find a distance. But just to confirm that it is actually a minimum, we will take and test these two critical points and focus on this one only. We want to confirm that that is indeed a minimum. So I'm going to use the first derivative test by just testing something on just this one side because remember we talked about multiplicities. We know that whatever we find here, it will alternate and alternate because there is no even multiplicity and it's not gonna be the same on both sides of it. So I'm gonna test something that I know is definitely bigger than the square root of 120, like the square root of 400. I know the square root of 400 is just 20, so I'm gonna plug in something like that I'm going to plug in 20 into my first derivative. And if I plug in 20 
to this, which I circled so I wouldn't lose it. I know that when I take this and put it down in the bottom, I get something pretty large there, but let's work it out. We will get 10 minus 1200 over 20 squared. And we know 20 squared is 400. So the hundreds will just cancel out and we get 12 over four, which is three. In other words, the only thing we were concerned with is positive. If you wanna use an even bigger number, by all means do, just make sure that it is actually to the right of your critical value. And because that's positive, we know that the next one would be negative, next one would be positive. And because this is the first derivative that we are testing, then we know that this means out here that it is decreasing until we got to our zero, and then it went to increasing, which means this is indeed what we wanted it to be, a minimum. And because we have now found our x, of course, we only wanted the positive value so that we could have a distance. How are we going to find the y? Because they wanted the dimensions. Well, again, I lightly circled so that I wouldn't lose it. I already solved for what y would be in terms of x. So now, unfortunately, we do have to plug in that x value in order to find the y. So we would get our x, we'll plug in here and get this, which the only thing that we can really simplify would be the two, and we would get our y value is 100 over the square root of 30, with our x being two root 30. So those would be the dimensions in, of course, meters to get our square meters. As I've mentioned to you guys many times before, especially in these word problems, where can you go wrong? Anywhere and everywhere. So be careful, pay attention to details, keep in mind what you're trying to do and accomplish, and of course, use what they gave you in order to draw and come up with an equation to solve what they asked you to. All right, well, here's the next one, and this is a little bit different, so I wanted to go over the very next one uh, that talks about cost, revenue, profit, those types of things that we've dealt with in the past but wanted to revisit and give you an example. So here's number four. Let's read it, see if we can either draw a diagram or write some of the important information down and then answer and then answer what they asked us to. Here we go. The landlord of a 40 unit apartment building is planning to increase the rent. Only thing I see of interest there, 40 units. Current residents pay 700 a month and there are four vacant units. She's hired a management firm to try and increase the revenue. That might be of importance to us. And they found that every $25 a month increase would result in one more person leaving. So what she would like to figure out is how to maximize her revenue by figuring out what to charge. Because when she does increase that $25, she's getting that for all 36 units. But as it mentioned, Every time in that 40 unit with four vacant, so that's 36, every time she would increase it by another $25, one more person would leave. But she's getting $25 a month more for every person that's still there and paying. So what we're trying to figure out is how to maximize revenue. So the first thing we need to figure out is what are we going to let our unknown, our variable, B, well, the thing that's changing here is that $25 a month increase. And what we need to figure out is how many of those price increases of $25 increments we should make. So that's what I'm going to let our variable be so that we can then solve for that and figure out how many of those $25 a month increases we should make. Now, this one should be pretty obvious as to what equation we should be using. And that is obviously what we're trying to maximize is revenue. And if you remember, revenue depends on a few things. Price of whatever the thing is that you're selling and also the quantity or what they call the demand. Okay, How many things and at what price is how much you're going to rake in that revenue. 
We're just going to call that P and Q so that we can quickly reference the price and the quantity. And we're going to set that up according to all of the information given in this paragraph. So let's talk about the price. What would the P be? Well, the price for us is actually how much we're going to bring in. And we know it's 700 a month. And it would also be $25 in addition. But we don't know how many times. We're trying to figure that out to maximize our revenue. So it would look like where we're going to get that 700 that we already charge plus how many times are we going to have that price increase of $25? We're not sure yet. All right. And then how about the Q, the quantity? Well, even though it's a 40 unit apartment, remember there were already four vacant units. They weren't completely full. So we're going to be starting with 36. And remember they said that they're going to subtract every time one unit, every time they raised it another $25. So that would be the X, dependent on how many number of increases we end up doing. So we got our equation, and luckily we were able to take the P and the Q and write them both in terms of X. And that would result in the equation looking like, to maximize our revenue, we figured out what the price and quantity or demand would be, you know, all in terms of X, which is nice. Let's foil distribute this out to get our product to disappear because we know that we want to take the derivative and set it equal to zero to find those local max and min possibilities. So doing that would yield the 700 times 36 gives us a pretty big number there. And then negative 700x, positive 900, and then negative 25x squared. So we can clean this up just a bit to give us and finally, now that we have our simplified version of our revenue equation in terms of X, which is the number of price increases that we're trying to figure out we should do in order to maximize this revenue, you know if it says max or min, we're going to take the derivative and set it equal to zero to find those, just like we did with X's and Y's before we're getting to these real world applications. So taking the derivative of these, pretty simple. That's not the hard part, right? Setting all of this up from this is. So now doing that gives a constant goes to zero. This is just 200 and negative 50. Now, keep in mind, if we're trying to maximize this, if we just turned it back into X's and Y's, do you guys remember what kind of graph shape, if that's my highest degree of this equation? Do you remember if it's negative in front of our x squared, that would just be a downwards facing parabola, which means we are going to have a maximum, what we wanted, where our derivative is equal to zero. The slope of the tangent is horizontal, zero. So that's all we're doing here, but again, in real world scenarios. So taking this and setting it equal to zero would give us adding the 50x over, would give us 200 on one side, 50x on the other, and now all we have to do is divide by 50 to get an answer of four. Now remember, we do wanna actually physically check, even though we know that this is a downwards facing parabola, so this has to be the one and only and a maximum. But just to confirm, I'm gonna show you with a little bit of review. I did the first derivative test in that first example. Let's do the second derivative test because look at this derivative. Super simple to take the second derivative of and get zero and negative 50, which means there is no x, which means the entire concavity would be negative. So even if I try to test and plug this in, it is always going to come out negative. There is no variation, which is why there's no variable here. It's always going to be concave down, which means we will have at our critical point, a maximum, because it's facing concave down. Okay, that's the second derivative test. We have tested that it is indeed a max. All right, so that means overall, what have we found? Well, we should have four price increases of 25 a month, meaning 
if we raised it to $800 a month, we would lose four more vacancies, which we already had four. So now we would be down to 32, but we would actually be earning $800 a month. If we plug that four in here, you can see that would add 100. And the 800 times the 32 is going to be the maximum for those less, even four more units down to 32 units. That would give you the most revenue. All right. So hopefully those two help. Again, the only way you're going to get better at these is by getting in there, doing them yourselves. And don't be afraid. You're going to make mistakes, but don't give up. Keep working hard to comprehend these and take whatever they've given you and make that one equation with hopefully one unknown in order to take the derivative, set it equal to zero to find those critical points, which will tell you where your possible maximums and minimums are located. Just don't forget, you should check to confirm that it is indeed what you wanted, a max or min. First derivative test or second derivative test. That's it for this one. Take care, everyone. Until the next time, Alan, signing off.